Mr. Judd Apatow, ladies and gentlemen. How Thank about you. That? We're looking at probably, you know, several hundred of the smartest people in the Chicago area who figured out a way to get to the Art Institute, even though there are two million maniacs right outside the door over the last couple of hours. So congratulations to you guys, and welcome to Chicago, sir. It's great to be here. You know, I, I love the book. It's, it's a wonderful read, and it's, it's great because you can, you can just pick and choose, you know, which uh, segments and excerpts and interviews you want to look at. But I have to say, Judd, it's, I think, 400 and almost 500 pages. Everything I do is long. Yeah. And I'm like, I, exactly. I'm like, you know, it's just like your movies. I mean, Profiles Encouraged, John Kennedy wrote, it's like 250 pages, exactly. you know. But Judd, 500 pages. You're going to get your money's worth with this. I realize book. that I'm a hoarder in all aspects of life, <laughs> and I don't want to let go of anything. Like, people will say, oh, your movies are long. And then they go home and watch 11 episodes of Breaking Bad in right. a row. <laughs> I'm like, fuck you, I need five more minutes. Give me a break. Yeah, it's so true, because people say, oh, it's two hours and five minutes. And they'll watch a football game that's three and a half hours, and then another football game, another, another football game. And, you know, I, I think it's all because when you're at the movies, you just wish you could pause it and take a piss. Yes. And so people are mad that they can't. Because no one ever says the movies are long at home, right. but uh, in, in a theater. And I think everyone in a theater is annoyed now because people are texting and, right. and it, it, they're, you don't want to be there as much. Yeah, and you know, uh, Roger Ebert always used to say, no good movie can be too long and no bad movie can be too short. It's really about, I mean, if it's a good yeah. film, why wouldn't you want to spend another 15 or 20 minutes with the characters from Knocked Up or 40-Year-Old Virgin or films well, like that? Well, once James Brooks said to me, he said, you know, when your movie is that long... You're basically saying to the audience, I think these people are worth your time. And uh, I thought, well, that, that makes sense. Not everyone agrees with it, but that makes sense. <laughs> now, you know, when you were growing up, you and I are basically the same generation. I'm a few years older than you. But it was, it was very different when we were growing up in terms of comedy and, and distribution systems and all that. And you were this, you know, this comedy nerd, which right now, if you were Judd Apatow at 15, you'd find... 5,000 other kids like you on the internet, but you were kind of on your own with this as you like really got into comedy at a, at a very young age. Yeah, it was, it was so different. I mean, when I was a kid, I grew up in, uh, you know, I, I graduated college, uh, high school in 1985. So when I was, you know, 10 years old, you know, it was 1978, and uh, no one liked comedy at all. There was no one to talk to about it. I, I mean, most of my friends are athletes, and they would go play football, and I would go home every day and watch the Dinah Shore show, <laughs> then the Mike Douglas show, then the Merv Griffin show, then, you know, Happy Days of Vernon Shirley, all of those. Then I'd watch The Tonight Show, and then Letterman, and always watch Love Connection. Don't know why. Maybe four straight years where I didn't miss Love Connection. <laughs> I just felt like there were answers there that I needed. And nobody, there was no one to talk to about it. So I didn't really, you know, connect with comedians until, you know, my parents got divorced and my mom took a job seating people at a comedy club on Long Island when I was uh, 14 years old. And I only uh, realized later that my mom must have taken the job for me because how much do you make seating people <laughs> at a comedy club? And I literally never thought about it. My mom, you know, has since passed away, and, and, and I thought, wow, that must have been some gift or some bit of destiny, because it sounds like the worst job in the world for, you know, a 40-year-old newly divorced woman who has no money. And uh, that's when I met comedians, and then I thought, oh, I wish I could talk to them. How do I get them to talk to me? And I'm a kid, so uh, our high school radio station uh, it was ran like a real radio station, but the signal barely got out of the parking lot of the high school. And my friend used to go interview like R.E.M. and all these bands in 1983. And one day he said, you know, you should try to interview comics. And so I interviewed 45 comedians for this radio show. And I was like a lunatic. I would call their publicists <laughs> and I would act like I was from a real radio station. I never said I was a high school student. I just said, hi, this is Jed Apatow from WKWZ Radio. <laughs> Love to do an interview with your client, Gary Shanley. And they would always uh, let me interview their clients because back then no one wanted to interview Gary Shanley. <laughs> you know, no one wanted to interview Seinfeld. They were all young comedians, and they probably looked like good publicists to their clients for getting them this interview. And then I would show up at their door 
<laughs> with a giant, t like a boom box. And they would look at me like, oh shit, it's a child's. <laughs> but they couldn't cancel. And then I was so enthusiastic that I was fun to talk to because I just loved it so much. And sometimes, you know, kids now will say, hey, can I interview you? Like you interviewed comedians when you were a kid. And I always say no. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. But even then, I mean, you've always had this great eye and, and feel for, for budding talent. I mean, you... It's not like you interviewed a bunch of comics who are now, you know, working on a, on a, in a toll booth somewhere. We're talking about Jerry Seinfeld, right before he really popped. And, yeah. you know, talk a little bit about that experience, because, I mean, you figured out pretty early that this guy was going to be something special. Right? Well, I, you know, I, I wasn't into sports that much. I liked the Mets, but I, I, I was more interested in tracking comedians the way kids would track Daryl Strawberry's career. So I would see someone on TV like Jerry Seinfeld, and then I'd see him on Merv, and then I'd see him on The Tonight Show, and I would just follow what he was doing, and it was my way of like trying to pick the best athletes. And I feel like even now, that's all I do, is I just see comedians, and I think, oh, I wish Amy Schumer had a movie. She seems like she'd be a great movie star. Oh, that's not gonna happen unless I do it. <laughs> I'll call her, maybe she has an idea. And it, it feels very similar. But back then, the people, <coughs> excuse me, the people who were my favorites were like Jay Leno and Jerry Seinfeld and Gary Shandling. And so I got to interview them when they were talking about their dreams. I mean, they were just young comedians. And then for the book, I interviewed Gary again and Seinfeld again. And it's funny because you get to see me as this 15 year old talking to them. And then now, me as a 47-year-old saying to them, how was that ride? What did you make of doing Seinfeld? What are you doing now? How does it feel to finish Seinfeld? And how do you decide what else you want to do? And how do you raise your kids? Like what? And so it's a very different type of conversation. And that's a, a fun aspect of the book, is going back. Yeah, because now you're in the club. You're, you're a peer with these guys, so it's a different conversation. But... Um, You've always been a huge, as you mentioned, you know, a huge fan of, of you know, the real art and the, the, the craft of stand-up comedy, and you wanted to be a stand-up comedian. You just yes. recently kind of returned to it, right? You've That's true. Stage again. All I wanted to do was to be a stand-up comedian. Sometimes they say all of the work I've done as a director and a writer has just been a way for me to get better spots at the improv. <laughs> because all I wanted to do was be a comedian, and uh, I did it from the time I was 17 until I was 24, and I was on the HBO Young Comedian special, and I was doing pretty well. But I kept getting much better work as a writer. And I was aware that my friends were way funnier than I was. Like, I lived with Adam Sandler, and David Spade lived down the street, and Rob Schneider lived across the street, and we all hung out with Jim Carrey, and I would write sketches for In Living Color for Jim Carrey on the side. And and, and slowly I just went, I don't think I'm ever going to be as good as these people. And I didn't, I didn't want to be mediocre. <coughs> Excuse me, I have pneumonia. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. <coughs> and, uh, and so I decided, uh, you know, that the universe was telling me to write and, uh, and direct and do all of this stuff. But then about a year and a half ago, I, I was working with Amy every day. And she would come back from the road and she would have these great stories and she was having so much fun. And I finally just said, you know, I think, I think I'm going to do, do stand-up again. What do you think? And she was very encouraging of me doing it. And I said, how about this? Write down premises for, for routines, and I'll, I'll write the routine. So every day she would email me a premise, like, what if you had boys instead of girls or something like that? And I wrote a bunch of jokes over a few weeks. And then when we shot the movie, I went to the Comedy Cellar and did stand-up for the first time in 22 years. And then I've done it ever since, and now we're on the road, and we're here tonight in uh, Chicago. I don't know if any of you are coming to the show tonight. Uh, we're doing a train wreck tour with Amy and Dave Attell, Colin Quinn, Vanessa Bayer, and uh, Mike Rabiglia, and we're giving all the money to uh, charity. That's awesome. The universe was telling you, maybe not to be on stage, but you also had a couple of anecdotes or a couple of episodes where, you know, for example, I think somebody associated with the Muppets wasn't quite sure. That oh, that's a terrible story. It's please, a terrible story. Please share. Do I tell that story in the book? I it's, forgot. Yes. I, I tell it all the time now. Okay, so a bunch of things happened which discouraged me from staying a performer. And one of the main ones was I had a, an audition 
to host a show with Adam Sandler for Jim Henson of Muppet fame. And so it was gonna be a show where two guys travel across America with a video camera and just, I guess, you know, the beginning of reality TV in, in, in some way. This is in 1990 or whatever. And so we did the audition, then I get a call. You didn't get it, but Jim Henson wants to buy all your ideas. He doesn't want you in it because he thinks you lack warmth. I'm like, Jim Henson, Kermit the Frog, says I lack warmth? The warmest guy in the world? That's like Mr. Rogers telling you you don't deserve love. And it really hurt me. And on some level, I took it as another sign, oh, you shouldn't be in front of the camera. And then recently, I thought, I don't think he said that. I think maybe the casting director said that. I can't imagine that Jim Henson said to the casting director, uh, hey, could you do me a favor? Uh, <laughs> could you call uh, Judd Apatow? And, uh, I just wanted to give him some feedback. Uh, just, can you tell him he's not attractive? <laughs> and also not ugly enough to be interesting looking. <laughs> and also tell him he lacks warmth. Actually, maybe you should say he's devoid of warmth. <laughs> no lacking. I just don't want him to think he has much. Well, you obviously, you're, you're a guy at, at a very young age, too. I mean, you can take criticism, and, and you were pretty relentless in your, your pursuit of meeting a lot of your idols, including Steve Martin. How old were you when you uh, approached Mr. Martin? I met Steve Martin when I was 12 years old. Uh, 12 or 13 years old. It was in 1980. And I was on vacation. My grandma lived in Beverly Hills. And we knew where Steve Martin's house was. So every time we would drive into town, I would say, drive by Steve Martin's house. And I never thought I would see him. I just liked the idea that there was this white block building with no windows it was very modern, and that Steve might be in there. And because I loved him so much. I mean, he really was as popular as any person in any art form ever at, the, at that moment. And one day we drive by, I look out the window, and there's Steve Martin. Just, I, I think he might have been washing his car or something. And I jump out of the car with a piece of paper, they say, Mr. Martin, can I please have your autograph? And he said, uh, no, I'm sorry, I don't sign autographs at my house. Which I understand, because if someone came up to my door, I would call the police. <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. So he said, I, I, I don't sign autographs at my house. And I said, well, will you sign it in the street? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, no, I can't, because if I do, people are going to come to my house all the time, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I said, oh, please, I won't tell anyone where you live. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, I really, I really can't. And so I went home furious, and I wrote him a letter, dear Mr. Martin, you're the funniest man in the world, but you treat your fans like garbage. If I didn't buy all of your records and go to all your movies, you wouldn't live in that house. <laughs> and if you don't send me a formal apology, I'm going to send your address to Homes of the Stars, and you're going to have tour buses passing by 24 hours a day. <laughs> and then I put it in his mailbox. No stamp. <laughs> I know where you live. So then, I mean, it felt like it was six months later, but certainly three or four months later, I, I open up the mail, and there's a, a book of, uh, he had a book of like funny essays and poems called Cruel Shoes, and I open it up, and it says, To Judd, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was speaking to the Judd Apatow. <laughs> And so that was 35 years ago. And, that, and since then, 
what I took from it, one is that he's the greatest, funniest, nicest guy ever. The other is that I felt on some unconscious level that, he, that I made him laugh, that I made him laugh enough to make the effort to like try to make me laugh and to send me this book. And I thought, you know, that probably gave me some of the confidence uh, to try to do a lot of the things I did when I was a kid, like interview comedians, because in a weird way, he, he like reached through. It's like when an, it's like poltergeist when the hand comes through the TV, you know, where I thought, oh, maybe I could do this job. Well, Steve Martin's always had an interesting approach to all that. Of course, back in the day, people would come up to stars in the airport and want autographs. Now, nobody wants an autograph. They want to take a photo, and they're yelling at their husband because he's not getting it right, and then he takes a picture of himself. But I remember years ago, Steve Martin, uh, this is probably you know, 20, 25 years ago, when people would come up to him and ask for an autograph, he'd hand them the, a, a business card. This is Mr. Steve Martin. I am you know, acknowledging that this person met me and had a meaningful <laughs> encounter. And he would just give him that. <laughs> not a good way of doing it. He also was, he was used to send out letters, uh, like form letters that he would fill in certain key words on. And, and it would say, like, dear, and it would be blank, and he would write in, Judd, thank you so much, uh, you know, for your kind uh, letter, and, and uh, maybe next time I'm in, and then it would, he would write, like, Syosset, like, where I, you live, <laughs> you know, I will uh, come and, you know, bunk at your house, uh, and then... He goes, uh, he says, uh, but just remember, I'll never forget, uh, forget the fans. Will I, Judd? <laughs> and then it said, P.S., remember that week we were in Rio looking at the girls. <laughs> That's pretty great. He's a comic, too. You know, people might not remember that, you know, when Steve Martin hit it, it was a, it was a different kind of level because, you know, he went from the cl comedy clubs all of a sudden playing arena, Staples Center or you know, yeah. United Center or whatever, you know, Chicago Stadium. And I remember him talking about there was a moment when he went on stage and everyone was just going nuts and he realized he needed to stop doing it because it was all about the celebrity and people applauding his routines like almost like songs, like if you're at a U2 yeah. concert. And that's an interesting thing to see with comics. I mean, I think Leno told you something about that when he was coming up where he was a little bit afraid about becoming too famous because it would affect his comedy. Yeah, and I think what's, what's fascinating now is that comedians have decided that they will put out a special, like on Netflix, and then they'll tour, but they'll tour a completely different hour set uh, than the special. So they're all working, like they shoot a special, and then in the four months after they shoot it, before they let you see it, they write a whole new act, and then they put out the special, and then tour on the off the special. And that's what Steve Martin didn't do. He was on TV all the time. So he would go do like an arena and the audience knew all of his jokes. And they would scream them out before he said them. And, uh, but now it's like everyone has figured out how to do that. And people are playing arenas. Aziz Ansari plays 10,000 seaters. And uh, you know, Louis C.K., you know, they play Madison yeah. Square Garden. Yeah, Kevin Hart's coming to Chicago. He sold out the United Center, I think, three times, and that's a capacity yeah, of like twenty-two thousand people. That's just that's madness. But they still, you know, they they still kind of they love the art and they love doing it. Now you know, you've got Trainwreck coming out with Amy Schumer, and we were talking a little bit back backstage about Amy to see someone explode in the way she has. I can't remember the last time it's happened like this, and it's it's got to be great to see that and to be along for the ride. You're doing stand up with her but also the film, this is really, I think the, after the movie, it's gonna be a whole nother level of uh, fame for her. Yeah, it's been, it's been wild to see, because I, how I met her is I was listening to the Howard Stern show, and she was a guest, and I was just in my car. I didn't really know her stand-up, and she was so funny talking about the problems she was having with men, and her father has uh, MS, and she was talking very frankly about their relationship and the difficulties of that, but also in a really darkly hilarious, but loving way, and I thought, oh, these are movies. This is a person who has real stories to tell. And I called her, and she came in, and she wrote one movie for me, and when it was done, we thought, you know, that's not what the first one should be. And then she uh, and I started talking about just her problems. I, I just said, well, wh let's, let's write something more personal. What are you going through? Like, why don't you have a boyfriend? Like, wh what do you think that's about? And when you have weird breakups, what goes wrong? 
And she started telling me just everything, just the truth. And that turned into train wreck. The TV show wasn't even on. She hadn't even uh, done the first season of the show. And so over the course of the, the, the several years that we developed the script, the show got bigger and bigger. And now the movie's coming out after her, is this the third season of her show? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. And she's getting more and more confident and more and more brilliant. And I think the, the movie is um, the culmination of all of this. And she did an amazing job. The movie came out great. When you first talked to the studio about a, a movie with Amy Schumer, I mean, you know, you look at your films and all the people, and some of them weren't that well known when you worked with them, but they were pretty big stars. And like people, you know, you have a brand name now, obviously, and people think of, of the Seth Rogans and, and people like that. Did the, did the studio execs say, Amy who? What, what are you doing here? Um, they, you know, I had to educate them as to who Amy was, but there's one good thing about people knowing who I am, which is I don't have to hire the most famous person in the world to work with. And they like breaking new people because I feel like it's like a new rock band. Like people love when there's a new band and you go, oh, I, I just, you know... It is like when my friend introduced me to REM. It's like you. It's like when you saw Zach Galifianakis, Galifianakis in the Hangover. It's so exciting to see someone, and you don't know what they're going to do. And so the studio is all for that. And I'm very lucky that I can look for people who need a break, and that the studio is excited for me to use a new person. Well, you know, when you look back at your work, it's easy now to say, oh, you know, Steve Carell, or oh, you know, Michael Sarah. But again. You know, when, when The 40-Year-Old Virgin came out, we're watching it now through the lens of, well, Steve Carell, you know, 10 years on The Office and all that, but The Office had just started when the film was coming out, I believe. Yeah, I, you know, we were shooting Anchorman, and Steve Carell was just so funny. And you know someone's funny when Will Ferrell's on the side going, what's going on with Steve? I mean, <laughs> this guy is on fire, and... Everything he said, we were all like, oh my God, Brick Tamlin. I've never laughed as hard as this guy doing Brick. And so, uh, I love Lamp. You know, you're on set with a guy, and he's improvising, and he just turns and goes, I love Lamp. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> and then we're in editing, and we would edit the movie, and every time we edited it, we really would laugh. Everything about Anchorman would make us laugh in the editing room. And usually what would happen is after looking at a scene like 50 times, you would just start looking to see what the other characters who didn't have any lines were doing in the scene. And you would notice just, oh, look how Carell's eating a banana in the background. <laughs> and, uh, and so I said to him, hey, do you have any ideas for movies for yourself? And he said, you know, I did this sketch in Second City I always saw it could be a movie where I played a 40-year-old virgin. And as someone with major sexual problems. <laughs> I just knew exactly what it was. It was almost like a scene from 2001 Space Odyssey where like a thousand images go through my head in one half second. And uh, and the office, uh, you know, had only been on six times and hadn't taken off yet. And uh, again, the studio was very open to breaking someone in the way Anchorman broke Will and old school did. And you know, two days into the shoot, the studio calls, and they shut down the movie because they think there's problems. And I, and the, the movie was going great. We shot the speed dating uh, sequence. I don't know if you remember that when he's on the speed date and he's uh, he's like, "Hi, Gina," and she goes, "Gina," and uh, <laughs> and the woman's boob popped out in the middle of the speed date. And I'm so shy. I did like one take of the boob popping out and. I didn't realize that she was probably a stripper or something like, who doesn't care at all about having her boob out, but I'm like, okay, we got it, we got it. <laughs> and so, so they shut me down. Now, usually I would like scream and curse, and you know, that's why most of the TV shows got canceled, because I just couldn't handle these moments of conflict. I, I always would hate the moment where someone had the power to make you change something creatively that could ruin it in, in your mind. And so I said, okay, I'm not gonna freak out. I'm just gonna listen, let me see what their issues are. They said, okay, we think the movie is lit like an independent movie. I had the, the 
the cinematographer from Unforgiven shoot. And it didn't look like an indie movie, but I'm like, all right. And then they said, uh, Paul Rudd is really fat. <laughs> really, he looks terrible. And I'm like, well, we kind of like that he's like miserable. His girlfriend, Mindy Kaling, just broke up with him. And they're like, seriously, he's supposed to be the handsome guy in the movie. I thought <laughs> he was a handsome guy. I'm like, okay, I can ask him to lose weight. I mean, we don't, we're only shooting him for seven more weeks, but we'll see what we can do. <laughs> and if you watch the movie, he is a different weight in every scene <laughs> in the entire movie. And then they said, and we think that Steve looks like a serial killer. <laughs> he's got that members-only jacket, and he's riding a bicycle. And I said, well, I guess we could make jokes about the fact that he looks like a serial killer. And so then that became part of the movie, and it actually became the climax of the movie, which is Catherine Keener comes to his apartment, and Steve has somehow stolen all of the models of vaginas from the health clinic, <laughs> and he has... He has uh, Paul Rudd's box o porn. Uh, back when you needed a box o porn, because you don't need it anymore, uh, and uh, and it helped the movie. And then they also forced me to bring this amazing editor, who's now a director named John Pohl, onto the movie to to help. And he really was incredibly helpful. So it all worked out. But for a moment, it, it seemed a little shaky. <laughs> yeah, and it was great to, to kind of acknowledge that, because I think uh, Catherine Keener's kid at one point says, wow, you're 40 and you ride a bicycle and you do magic. Yeah. <laughs> it's really impressive. Because <laughs> if you look at it from that standpoint, I can see the yeah. studio being a little worried about, about these characters. As a writer, you know, you, you, one of the great things about a lot of your work is there are a lot of good roles for women. I mean, they're not just the wife that's on the phone saying, are you never coming home, or that kind of thing. Is that is it a different challenge for you when you're writing parts for women? Do you talk to your wife? You know, uh, people probably know Jez married to Leslie Mann, who's a terrific actress. Is is she your one of your sounding boards? Do you you know. Well, she's really the you know, the uh, the main sounding board. I mean, I met Leslie. Uh, well, first let me say this. The other day, Leslie says this to me. She says, "Hey, Judd, by the way, my name is Leslie." It's not Leslie. And I'm like, we've been married for 18 years. You can't just throw that at me out of the blue. I'm like, then fine, then my name is Jed Epito. And so, uh, you know, it, you know, when you live with an actress, you also see the quality of the scripts that are out there and floating around town for women, and that the parts, especially in the 90s, were very much, uh, you know, women that a man might fall in love with, a perfect woman. They weren't flawed characters. You know, some people, you know, have given me a hard time about some of the, the female characters being really edgy, and, and I always felt like, well, I feel like men drive women crazy, and, and they're put in a position that they hate, which is the position of you know, trying to correct them. And, and I always think that's a funny dynamic and that Leslie you know, has played that so hilariously in, in, in some of the movies. And, uh, and, but she always said these, <coughs> excuse me, uh, she always said that these parts are uh, you know, very thin. And I, I got a job uh, punching up the wedding singer Adam Sandler asked me to do a polish on it, and I thought, you know what, I'm gonna work my ass off on this Drew Barrymore part. Like, this is always the part that's not great. And then the movie came out really well, and I just thought, yeah, you can really make these, these parts really good. And then uh, Paul Feig brought me Freaks and Geeks, and that was really about Lindsay, about Linda Cardellini's character, and Paul really always felt strongly about, you know, the female characters, and and so, uh, you know, that's always been a challenge because I'm a man, I always feel like I understand 1% of what a woman thinks. And so in the beginning, I was probably more reticent to jump into something where the lead is Amy Schumer. But what I ultimately discovered was it works best when I'm in collaboration with somebody. So if I make a movie where Kristen Wiig and Annie Mumolo write Bridesmaids, or Lena Dunham is the visionary of Girls, or Amy Schumer wrote Trainwreck, that we can have an amazing collaboration where I can bring everything I know to it, but they can really be the main force behind 
telling female stories because there has been a real dearth in, in female directors and producers and writers and hopefully that's begun to change uh, but there's some you know, brilliant people out there and I think the most fun I've had in my career has been working with people like Lena and Amy Schumer. You mentioned uh, Freaks and Geeks. I just recently, you know, you go back and you're like, oh, I'm going to watch one episode. And then you end up watching all of them because you got, and it's, I mean, it's such a bittersweet thing because it's such a good show and it's so well done. And, and then it went away. And if, if, if it come out now, you would have found somebody at Hulu or Amazon. Yeah. Somebody would have picked it up. Freaks and Geeks would have yeah. lived on. But it's still great. And it's amazing to see that cast and how good they were then. And yeah. what they've done since then, I mean, just no, amazing. It's, it, and I felt it then, like when we were doing it, you know, it's a weird thing, but I'd be hanging around Seth Rogen or Franco or Linda and just thinking, these are superstars. How are they going to cancel this show? This is like, we're the Avengers right now, you know? Like, everyone's here. And so as the years go by, we did that show in 1999, so it's 16 years later. And I just saw... Jason Siegel in this movie about David Foster Wallace called uh, The End of the Tour. It was one of the great performances I've ever seen. And so year after year, each of them just keeps doing something spectacular. And so I'm just so proud of everybody. I can't, I can't believe, uh, you know, I can't believe what James Franco's done in the last 18 hours. <laughs> I think he was actually on the Blackhawks for a couple of games, you know, while picking up a master in fine arts and doing two short films. Uh, yeah, there seems there's like there's like nine of him. Um, we we're talking a little bit about about Leslie, and she's such a gifted performer. But there are times when she's in roles where she has to have love scenes, and I think yeah. some actors have been cooler about that than others. I well, think. I uh, I never mind when Leslie is in a love scene because usually I write it. So I can write it in a way I can handle it. <laughs> I'm not writing blue is the warmest color. <laughs> Centipede seven, honey, it's gonna be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but like I like making her make out with Paul Rudd because I know neither of them enjoy it. <laughs> the only time I ever got annoyed was we were doing this movie Drill Bit Taylor with Owen Wilson. And and I just want the person who has to make out with my wife to, to do the noble thing. And beforehand, just walk over to me and go, sorry, man, it's just a job. I'm sorry. But Owen is the opposite. He's like, hey, Judd. <laughs> and they have this long, steady cam shot. They have to make out for like so long, I was going to vomit. <laughs> and afterwards, he's like, hey, Judd. <laughs> no apology. Then he even, like, me and Leslie were walking, and he walks, he's in a car, and he just goes, hey, Leslie, you need a ride back to base camp? I'm standing right here. Yeah. <laughs> you do a lot of stuff on, on social media, which, again, is something when we were coming up, nobody could have envisioned that, and it, it's such a, a, a great platform for you to let people know what you're doing and, and talk about things. And I mean, you know, you hear about trolls and all that, but I, I think for the most part, it's great. And most of the feedback you get is terrific. But you're a guy, you know, there are a few filmmakers who are very well known. I mean, you think of the celebrity directors, you know, you, you love going on the talk shows, going talking with Howard or going on with Conan. We, we're not gonna see Spielberg telling an anecdote like, you know, to Jimmy Fallon and you, you enjoy doing that. Uh, for, for comics, who, you know, if you see Louis C.K. on stage, if you see Gilbert Gottfried do his routine, I mean, they go every place they want to go, and they should, and it's comedy, but if they tweet something, all of a sudden, it's like, you know, with Gilbert, you know, Affleck fires him because he makes some tsunami jokes, and I'm like, have they never heard his act before? So for comics, it's got to be really tough because they're tweeting as themselves, not as a comic, and they, you know, it can, it can destroy careers, which is insane. Well, it's tricky because it's all about context, and I think people have different philosophies about humor. I think that you could say anything if your heart is in the right place, if your intention is correct. You know, I think it's okay to make a Holocaust joke as long as you're not pro-Holocaust, you know? I think it's all right, all right to say, here's the worst thing that ever happened and find humorous ways to discuss the horror of it. Uh, there's nothing wrong with reminding the world of terrible things, and also just to discuss how we deal with it, how we get past it, what we learn from it. 
And jokes and even very dark jokes can serve that purpose. But there are other people that also think that one of the reasons to be funny is because you're laughing at the face of just the horrors of being alive. You know, certain things happen and there's no explanation. You can't figure out if God existed, why would he allow this to happen? And sometimes you think the only way to survive as a person is to say the funniest, meanest, craziest thing about it as just a fuck you to the universe. You know, and, and that's not necessarily my favorite type of humor, but I definitely understand that type of gallows humor that think certain subjects are so bad that you just say the worst thing you can say. That's why the day after a tragedy, there's just millions of jokes written uh, about what happened. So I, I, I understand it. And I have a lot of sympathy for anyone who makes jokes on any topic because in the end, jokes are just a conversation. They're not changing the world. They're not changing political policy. It's just a way we deal with things. And if you don't like, you know, a certain comedian, then just uh, watch another comedian. If you don't like a certain show, if you don't love South Park, uh, you know, you can watch uh, a rerun of the Brady Bunch. <laughs> let's uh, let's take a few questions from the crowd. Um, we've got two folks walking around with microphones there. So if, if you first question, the Blackhawks, can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> what they did this year was unprecedented. Every question's about the Blackhawks. That's fantastic. <laughs> just yeah, just make, wait, make sure you have the mic before you ask. Go ahead, please. So it seems like you look like you should be at, like at the White House press room. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, 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 Mr. President, a uh, couple of questions about the Keystone Pipeline. They made a lot of fun of me at the Blackhawks rally too. Um, <laughs> it seems like a lot of your movies and a lot of um, comedies that imitate your movies now have an obligatory scene with people getting high. And it seemed to, for me... Mandatory. It, it, so, so I want to know why, because for me, it seems to take away from the, uh, I think, beauty of the rest of the comedy that you're putting out there. Well, I think, uh, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, people debate all the time. You know, scenes where people are drunk. I mean, you know, the big scene is on, in uh, Dumbo is them having uh, hallucinations, isn't it? I mean... <laughs> You know, the idea of like a scene where people get drunk or high as a way for them to express other thoughts that they have is, is very, very common. And um, Seth Rogen and I always debate, you know, whether or not I'm portraying it in a pro or anti-drug way. I always say it's anti-drug because I never saw a Cheech and Chong movie and thought, that's a lifestyle I'd like to <laughs> copy. I liked that they were idiots, but I didn't want to be an idiot. And, uh, and Seth always says, no, you're fooling yourself. Kids are getting high to these movies. And so we agree to disagree uh, about it. But yes, you can do it too much. It can be an easy move to, to get people wasted in a movie. And one day I will make a movie where that does not happen. Um, thank you so much for being here. I'm very honored to be here. And also, I'm a big fan of yours, and I really love Freaks and Geeks. And I'm so relatable to that story, because even though I didn't grow up in this country, I feel like your stories are so relatable. So, I mean, how is your, what is your interest on just, you know, like teenage or high school, uh, I guess drama or whatever the case is, but I mean, how that inspired you and also how did Amy and Lena Dunham got your attention? Like, how can I get your attention per se? You know, <laughs> what can I do? What I can I do? I kind of figured like, we were, what, we were you, driving around looking for recommend? that parking space. Yeah. Well, first you would need a fantastic accent. <laughs> and you've already accomplished that. Well, I, you know, Paul Feig uh, is an old friend of mine. We used to do stand-up comedy together. And he uh, uh, was in a movie we did called Heavyweights. Uh, 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 heavyweights oddly holds up. We're not sure why. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so one day I said to him, hey, I have a new deal with DreamWorks Television. They want me to bring in some TV ideas. Do you have any? And then he said, well, let me think about it. And then one day he just handed me the pilot of Freaks and Geeks, just a draft of it. And I instantly thought, I know exactly what this is. This is what my life was like. And 
he was so passionate about that world. He had so many amazing stories. He has an incredible memory, Paul Feig. He remembers every detail of everything. He remembers every piece of clothing everyone was wearing in certain moments. In fact, he would tell these stories and they were always so humiliating. They were always just the worst thing that ever happened to somebody. The, the stories always felt like something that happened to him when he was 12, like he got beat up. And then we would say, how old were you when that happened? And he always would go, 18. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and so we all tried to give our personal stories to the show. So I had gone, you know, my parents got divorced when I was a kid, and so I tried to inject a lot of the strife of kids with broken families I into the show. And I had been both a nerd and, not a pothead, but hung out with the potheads a bit. And so all the writers gave their stories. One of the great stories was this, this writer, Jeff Judah, said that once when he was a kid, he was homesick and he was watching the Phil Donahue show. And the show was all about how to know if your husband is cheating. And he watches it and he's, and he's home, he's like a little kid. And he realized that everything that they're saying as the, as the clue, his dad does. <laughs> and he became obsessed with figuring out if his dad was cheating and with who, and he found a garage door clicker in their car that was not theirs. And he said, he slowly tried to figure out, you know, what part of town was dad coming home through? Like he figured out, oh, he got mom flowers, but it was like kind of an out of the way location. And he would go around trying to open up garage doors. <laughs> And then Lena, I saw Lena's movie, Tiny Furniture, and it was incredible. And I said, hey, if you ever have anything that you, know, you need help on, let me know. And she, her friend, uh, Jenny Connor, who worked on our show Undeclared, was working with her on a TV show. And they just asked me to, to join them. That's fantastic. I, that episode of Freaks and Geeks, too, I mean, so a lot of your comedies, you know, everybody always says, well, it's a comedy. But, you know, you look at that episode of Freaks and Geeks and a lot of the stuff you've done, there's you know, genuine drama in there. I mean, there's room for that. And, these, and it's great to see that in comedies where it's not just one shtick, one scene after another, where you find time and space within the film for us to really feel like these are people that could live in, our, in the real world. I always feel like if you portray life accurately, it's a comedy. <laughs> like when I see a drama and there's no jokes, I always see, feel like, oh, this is bullshit. Because no matter how bad things are, there's always really funny moments. I wish they would do that like in the Taken movies, like during the credits, they should do the outtakes, you know. I'm going to kill you. Oh, wait, hold, hold on a second. What do we got? Anybody else here? Hi. Hi. Uh, so uh, Seinfeld was criticized for the first season of Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee for only choosing white men. Uh, and his response was something to the effect of, like, it doesn't matter where comedy comes from as long as it's funny. Do you think there's a barrier in comedy for women or the way they're portrayed? Obviously, there's been barriers. You know, it, it takes people making a strong choice to hire women, to hire women to write movies, to, to you know, fund uh, the dreams of these people. And also, I think there's a giant... Uh, financial incentive that needs to happen. I mean, Bridesmaids makes money, so people think, oh, women want to go to the movies and see, a mo see movies like these. But then it's, they're hard to write and they're hard to make. So this summer there's Pitch Perfect 2 and there's Spy and there's Bridesmaids, and so you feel like, oh, maybe the studios are beginning to see this is a gigantic market. One might say half of Earth. Uh, <laughs> and it would be smart to make movies for half of Earth. <laughs> and so now that, you know, there's, it's not a, a completely male world uh, running the studios and television, uh, we can see that changing and hopefully it will continue to change because they do just follow the dollar is what it is. But you also need women to make these movies because the men might not do it just because they don't know how to do it. And you do have to say, hey, Lena, how do you do it? Hey, Amy. What do you got? And, and hopefully a lot more of that will happen. This will be our last question. And it's going to be the best oh question. <laughs> Pressure. <laughs> um, I want to know, I am a young woman who is in comedy here doing stand-up, sketch, improv. What do you, what advice do you have for me? What advice do you have for women who are like me, who are trying to get involved in comedy? 
in whatever shape or form. What, what suggestions do you have for that? Well, I think the most important uh, suggestion uh, would be uh, to make things because I feel like it's so much easier for you than it was for me because there's the internet and the, you can make a movie on your phone. I mean, I would have to get Super 8 footage back in the day. I, and so there's, it's very inexpensive to do anything now. You can get good sound and good video and do anything and you can upload it to the, inter, to the internet and you could put it on Funny or Die, uh, which I work on, or any site. And if you did something great, it, it could go worldwide. It could have millions of hits the next day and then some people would go, who, who did that? And that is amazing. I mean, if I made a short film when I was a kid, how would I get anyone to look at it? And now it's easy. You just upload it and tell your friends and you start passing it around. And if it's good, maybe people will see it. I mean, the way Ben Stiller got a break was he spent, I think, like $10,000 or something. And he shot a short parody of the film The Color of Money, which is the Paul Newman, Tom Cruise, Martin Scorsese pool movie. And he did it with John Mahoney, and he played Tom Cruise, Ben played Tom Cruise, and it would, they did it about bowling. <laughs> and this is in like 1989 or something, or 88, and Ben sat in the lobby of NBC, and he waited for anyone from Saturday Night Live to walk by. And then he said, one day John Lovitz walked by and he gave him the tape and he said, Mr. Lovitz, will you please look at this tape? And John Lovitz looked at it and crazy enough, thought it was funny, gave it to Lorne Michaels. Lorne Michaels called him and said, I'm gonna air this on Saturday Night Live <laughs> this Saturday. Come in, like edit it down by a minute. And that's how hard it was to, to get exposed. So. Sorry about my pneumonia, but. So if you're, I don't know, are there other comedy people here right now? Uh, is all the Second City School here at this point? I O! <laughs> Annoyance Theater! Okay. Um, so you really can make your own opportunities, and you're insane if, if you don't, because it's inexpensive. It's only your own energy or laziness that's gonna speed you up or slow you down. And if you make one thing, go make like 10 more. Just keep, don't think the first one is gonna make you a star. Just learn how to do it by making tons of stuff. And, uh, and if you're talented, uh, it'll work for you. And uh, that's uh, the great part about show business. There are very few people who are geniuses who work hard, who don't, ultimately get found, especially in comedy. Uh, if, you're, if you're very special, you, you will do well, unless like, you're really weird and don't leave the house. <laughs> okay, sick in the head. If you don't, don't have it, get it. It's a great book. See Trainwreck. Good appetite, everybody. Thank you, Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming out. Thank you.